Nancy, I also got the pleasure of driving her from the airport last night, and I immediately connected with her, and I bet you will too. Um, raise the hands, who needs more sleep again? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, Nancy, you got some work to do. So, um, as a sleep ambassador, Nancy is globally known for sleep expert, on a, and she's on a quest to raise awareness, educate, and provide strategies to optimize sleep for everyone. An inspiring public speaker, Nancy's keynotes offers a pathway for people to improve the quality and quantity of their sleep, as well as to encourage them to seek appropriate medical care when needed. I also love the fact that how many people check, get their blood pressure checked regularly? Like, where are those people at again? Like, nice, taking care of you, that's awesome. Um, Nancy collaborates with recognized medical experts, researchers, and leaders in the field of sleep to advance and support sleep research and practice. Nancy's goal is to empower people to sleep well so they can live their life the best. She'll tell you more about her sleep courses, which have engaged over 400,000 people. Incredible, Nancy. Um, she'll also share with her um, her scholastic book, My Daddy Snores, and she'll bring out a copy of that. She's sold over 525,000 copies. I'm getting one too, I hope. Um, it's a testament that sleep is an issue for everyone, all ages, everywhere, inside homes, outside homes, in schools. Raise your hand if you've ever caught a student sleeping and left them sleeping. Good. All right, take it away, Nancy. So happy Thank to have you. you. Thank you, Nancy. So let me start by saying I love Maine. Now, people can say I love something and they like it and they came once, but I've been coming here since I was 10. And I found out that one of my table mates actually lives in the place in the town, Denmark, where I used to come for summers and still go. I've actually gone to this camp to help teach counselors how to make a bed and teach kids about sleep. So I guess I'll backtrack a little. How did I even start this quest? I started this quest because I had a snoring spouse. Does anybody have a snoring bed partner? Mm -hmm. So what did I know? I was, I was in finance, traveling the world, talking about financial risk management, when I realized that sleep's a risk management issue. So I started consulting to Procter & Gamble and going to big plants that make detergents and going and Hyatt and all these companies. And fast forward about 16 years and I, last week, oh, by the way, I'm so excited to do this in person because, <laughs> oh my God, last week, last week I did a virtual event for Deloitte, the consulting firm, and there were, I just got an email last night, we thought there were four, there were 1,500 people on the email. What does that tell us? And by the way, 88%, work exclusively at home. Unlike all of you, is there anybody here who works remotely? So very few. And so that's a real switch in our, in our, in our lifestyle this, these days. So many people are working from home. But you're right there. You're with the kids. And that book, My Daddy Snores, that was mentioned, that got me really committed to schools. I love going to schools because I love getting kids empowered, one, that everybody's an author, and two, to stimulate a conversation about sleep. So I saw a lot of hands for people who would like to get more sleep or better sleep. How many of you are champion sleepers? <laughs> Yay you. So integrate with that. Tell everybody, but what's your secret? Why? Why, why are we even talking about this topic? So this is my agenda. And the agenda is really designed to empower you because you'll hear me say it multiple times, only you can sleep for you. And, and so this agenda isn't, I, I'm not doing a lot of sleep science. I'll skim through some stuff because, you know, I'm humbled. You're educators. I guess I'm an educator. And what, what's important is that you have a foundation of science or information that is a catalyst to making choices in your behaviors. But by the way, we all know when we're really sleep deprived, making choices with our behaviors can be difficult, being falling asleep, hopefully not at the wheel, etc. 
why does sleep matter so much? Why, why is it suddenly getting attention? How many people here have ever taken a course on sleep? Look around. You're educators, and yet, and by the way, if I have my druthers, I'm announcing it here, I have been hounding Scholastic to do a series of sleep books for years. They're just, it's, it's, it's absurd. It takes up a third of our lives. We're educators and no one here. So let me give you a crash course on sleep. That's for sure. See that lion? Does anybody know how many hours a male lion sleeps a day? Yeah. Yeah, you got it, about 20. Females a little less. They're doing too much other stuff to help the male lion. So they, no, you didn't hear me say that. <laughs> but, but, but they wouldn't, they, they, they conserve energy, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is a really good perspective. You know, we'll see a slide in a minute that, that addresses that. And, and sustainability, I actually, I actually own the website. I haven't done anything with it. Sleepisgreen.com goes to my website. Because when you don't get enough sleep, talk about, talk about supporting the environment. You've got an internal environment. And your internal environment needs sleep to do what it's, we'll talk about that, designed to do. And you can't outsource your sleep. You can't have anybody do it for you. Get somebody to walk your dog if you're out all day, but you can't get somebody to sleep for you. Blurry. Blurry, blurry, blurry. Why? Because thank you, Thomas Edison, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, everybody, who's given us this technology and brought, the minute day was brought in tonight, we, our sleep started to go awry. And so the question is, what's the impact on you personally? Have you blurred the lines between day and night? Well, here it's clear. Why do I have it clear? This is perspective. A good night's sleep began when you woke up this morning. And we're going to talk about what you do throughout the day is going to impact how you sleep tonight. And a good day begins when your head hits that pillow. Because life is a 24-hour venture, and it's all connected. And more and more science is telling us a lot about it. You know, there's all this technology. You all just won these trackers. And if they do track your sleep, it's not, they're not going to be accurate, nor is your Apple Watch, Fitbit, all of that. But trends, does anybody here have an Aura ring? Have you heard? Well, an O-U-R-A ring. I just got one because I'm doing some work with them. And... I was hesitant to use it because I just don't want, I just, I'm into the whole, you know, what's natural, what, what was I designed to do? But if the information of your tracker gives you information that changes your behaviors or over time gives you trends that you relate to and that you understand and make choices as a result of, it's fabulous. Biology versus behaviors. We were designed to sleep. Our biology is not changing anytime soon. But our behaviors have completely changed. And so what happens is we're inflicting our behaviors on our biology, and it's chaos, which is why, again, how many people would like to improve their sleep? Yeah. So are you, are you, what are you doing? And, and good sleep is possible. I, I just came up with this last bit. Like, you're the app. <laughs> you are an app. The trillions of cells in our body, it's just like amazing what we do. It's just absolutely, in fact, so there's a new book out. I ordered it a couple days ago. It'll be there when I get home about awe, A-W-E. And there have been a bunch of articles in the last few weeks because of that book about awe. And I am in awe of sleep. I am in awe of what happens. And by the way, people always say, oh, how long did you sleep well? Last night, I said to Susan, she said, did you sleep well? And I said, uh, let's just say I was very empathic for people who don't as of last night. <laughs> because I just, you know, tossed and turned. I just wasn't, and I was like, really? I'm horizontal. I've got this speech. Why am I not sleeping well? Why am I up so many times? I did my tricks. I did my tools. 
I know I dreamt I had a couple of dreams because I was surprised when I woke up. Oh, so not every night is perfect for me either, but I try to practice what I profess. And ask yourself if you're wearing any technology, does it help your sleep if that's why you're wearing it? And lastly, three scientists won the Nobel Prize to discover that every cell has a clock. Again, best technology is inside of you, day and night. And if you're listening to it, it's going to tell you what you need when. So this is an interesting thing also. There's a new field called chrononutrition, like chronotype. Are you, uh, it used to be, are you a lark, are you an owl? Now it's, are you a bear or a wolf or a dolphin or this or that? Your constitution may be aligned to function at better times during the day or how you sleep or when you sleep. But it's all programmed inside of us. It's learning about it. And I also want to say, because it's so, I mean, I am uh, LinkedIn, the company LinkedIn's resident sleep expert. And I was so excited three years ago when they really put an emphasis be before the pandemic on mental health. And more and more companies, I, even, and all of you school counselors and nurses, before it was like you had an EAP or you had some, some issue and it was like so quiet. But now, in fact, I want you to all make a note, look up the CDC's definition of mental health because there's a distinction between mental health and mental illness. And the minute someone mentions, and this is my cry out for mental health, it doesn't particularly mean something's wrong with you. It's, it's your intellect, it's your emotions, it's all of those things. Somebody who has mental, everybody has mental health, somebody may or may not have a mental illness. But it's important to understand that, and the CDC has a great description of it all. So, why is sleep essential? These things, they're moving, because we're all moving so much. So, so let me take a couple of them and give just a minute of attention to a few of them, because everybody here would relate to one. Well, energy and resilience. How can you possibly be resilient when you're really sleep deprived chronically? And weight, you know, aside from gaining, losing, whatever weight, is anybody here, and you don't have to raise your hand, but ever experienced, I, I'm always, I exercise, I eat well, and I can't lose weight. And then you find out they get four to six hours of sleep a night. Well, we have hormones, two of them, and you can Google them for more information later, called ghrelin and leptin. And unfortunately, when you're sleep deprived, you get a double whammy. Ghrelin goes up so you're hungrier and you crave carbs. Leptin goes down, sending false signals to your brain that you're hungry and need more energy. So... Again, we're programmed for all this. So that's a big thing. Oh my gosh, judgment. You're in a meeting, you're in the classroom, you had a terrible night's sleep, you're, you're, you're a school nurse, you're t visiting with a kid, and, and there's something, you're just so tired, you could just nod off. How can you really do and have great judgment? And reaction time, drowsy driving, there's only one cure, fall asleep, and you do not want to do it at the wheel. Unlike drunk driving, at least your eyes are probably open. But, but, but when you're going to fall asleep at the wheel, you're going to fall asleep at the wheel. So don't drive drowsy. Just be honest with yourself. That we did, so has anybody ever experienced from sleep deprivation difficulty concentrating? Memory retrieval. Oh, my gosh. It's like you can't. I just don't remember. What, did, what was that person's name? Oh, gosh. Because look at that. Sleep-deprived brain, five times slower than a normally functioning brain. And earlier, I think I, I had this slide that said, is sleep a waste of time or is time a waste without sleep? And that's it. You know, that's, that's really it. So let's go through a little bit of science. So you've got to get enough sleep to get through these stages and cycles of sleep. Different, every organ in your body is engaged. Like, we are busy, we are like a city that never sleeps inside. And so much is going on. So who's ever had a dream and awakened from the dream feeling like you're paralyzed? Does anybody know why? 
So listen to this. When you're dreaming, and REM stands for rapid eye movement, it was discovered at the University of Chicago in the 50s with cats whose bodies weren't barely moving, they weren't moving, but their eyeballs were going back and forth. Rapid eye movement. When you are in REM sleep, your limbs are virtually paralyzed. Why? Scientists believe it's to keep us from acting out our dreams. And there, are, there is a, a sleep disorder called REM sleep disorder where people actually act out their dreams and it's not always pretty. So that's normal. So who gets, you know, you want to raise your hand, who gets less than seven hours? And seven to nine? And it varies. So 2% of the population at that are short sleepers and need less than seven. Certainly, you know, six isn't even so great. But the question is not just that. Quality, quantity, consistency, and I'm going to add, I'm going to mention naps there. Because naps can get a bad rap, and sometimes we just need them. But it's not, I'd rather see somebody get six hours of quality sleep than tossing and turning for nine. And we'll talk in a minute about why you may not get it. Consistency. Ah, we're back to our circadian rhythm. Your body loves, and your brain loves consistency. And when you, we all know when we're inconsistent with our sleep-wake time, we know we don't feel as well. We know when we're consistent, we start to get in a groove, our overall well-being, our balance are all better. Naps. So who here likes to take a nap? So naps are great, and you, you've all heard the term power nap. A power nap is under a half an hour or less. Why? Because when you go over a half an hour, anybody ever wake up from a nap groggier than you started? That's because you entered a sleep cycle and you're awakening in the middle of it. So I highly recommend if you're going to nap, set your phone. That's a time to have your phone near you, set your phone alarm, nap for half an hour or less. Try not to do it in bed. Exceptions. You're pregnant, you're sick, or you've got to drive and you're really tired or take care of something that needs your full attention and you're really tired you need a longer nap. But if you're napping regularly and needing one, two hour naps on a regular basis, you've got to look at your, your sleep schedule on a regular basis because something's wrong there. But naps are okay. Housekeeping function. So about, oh, I don't know, maybe at this point it's 15 years ago, scientists discovered something. Has anybody heard the term glymphatic system? So your brain actually has a cleansing mechanism. Literally flushes out toxins while you're in deep sleep. And when you don't get good sleep consistency, you know what happens? Your brain becomes like a dirty kitchen. You have, you have amyloid beta and you have all these plaque almost on your brain. Welcome to premature dementia. Look, I'm going to say it again, everybody. You're all at We were designed to sleep. And why are we having, I sometimes say to me, why am I here? And it's like because our behaviors are infringing on our biology. We talked about that. I mean, people just, some people just, I can't lose weight. And then you find out about their sleep habits. Or that they have an untreated sleep disorder. And we went through that. But it's important to recognize that this is not a waste of time, that being sleep. So this is so, you know, look at all these. So they're all tied together. And by the way, pretty much everything I say, other than maybe some breathing techniques and things like that, but even those, they're all scientifically based. So I'm not just saying Nancy Light thinks this is interesting. This is to help empower you and then we, we meant, she mentioned before the ripple effect. There's a huge ripple effect. If you learn this, you experience it, and you share it with your family, your colleagues, and certainly with kids. You know, the paradigm for kids, if you're really good, you can stay up late. You are naughty, you're going to bed. That is so out of whack. It should be the opposite. It, well, you're never going to say to kids, you, you were so terrific today, you can, you know, stay up all night. But... 
But we have this thing that we have um, structured in our lives. But I, I think kids, if they knew the science, I've done things for a children's museum and I wanted them to look through this little hole and see, wow, that's so cool. I didn't know that I was like, that I was growing during sleep and encoding memories. So big one here, depression and anxiety. My daughter's a psychotherapist. She didn't, she didn't even have a class that really, maybe sleep came up twice in grad school. Why? It's hugely tied to mental health. It's just, and it doesn't get, how many people here when you go for your checkup with your primary care get asked about your sleep? Look around. It's crazy. That should be one of their primary questions. But guess why? They're not trained. The average physician gets six hours of training about sleep. And it's usually related to other diseases. It's not even about sleep. And you want to talk about a pres natural prescription, there would be, instead of an, a, a pharmaceutical prescription. And that's OK. There's times to have that. But I don't, I'm an MBA, not an MD, so I don't recommend anything. But when people ask me, should I take melatonin? I go into the science of that they produce it naturally. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Immune function. Well, even vaccine efficacy and flu shot efficacy are related to sleep quality and quantity for that matter. So it's all there and through the pandemic, it became even more apparent how important sleep was for people. As and also in terms of restoration and rejuvenation, it makes it really hard when you're not sleeping well to recover from injuries, from disease, et cetera. I'm c we could spend an hour on this slide, but we're not. And so I decided, I just don't love the term sleep hygiene. I could have put poor sleep habits, but I, I started talking about disordered sleep, you know, a, a decade ago. That's just poor sleep habits. And you look at all of those, and the one we're going to focus on is breathing, because it's really, really cool. And sleep disorders, I'm sure, I have mild sleep apnea. I wear an oral appliance, juts my jaw forward, opens my airway. Do I look like the person who people thought that they have sleep apnea? No. But it's 85% of the people with sleep apnea are undiagnosed and untreated. And what that leads to is all kinds of havoc. So it's really important if you or somebody and by the way, you don't, I wrote the book on my daddy's snores. You don't have to snore to have sleep apnea, but it's really important. And there's all kinds of signs, morning headaches, um, even, even having to, to urinate a lot during the night can be a sign because you have fragmented sleep and then you wake up and you have to go to bed. So all kinds of things there. If you feel you're at risk or someone you care about is at risk for a sleep disorder or even a child that any of you see, make sure they get attended to. And probably, I'm going to say it, by a sleep specialist. Because I've heard far too many people tell me their primary care said, all you need to do is lose weight and you'll stop snoring. <laughs> so we take it for granted. Who here breathes? <laughs> so we all breathe. And it, it came in the last number of years essential that I talked about this. Because how you breathe 24-7 impacts how you function, how you live, and your health. So, question. And i got to tell you, don't feel funny if you don't know the answer here, because I work with the U.S. Army, and these soldiers didn't know, most of them, they were all, they were all dentists in the dental profession, because they've done some work, and I would say 80% of them didn't know if they were a nasal or a mouth breather. So, who here is, breathes mainly through your nose? Mouth, doesn't, don't know. Well, that's pretty impressive. You really have a sense of it. I'm going to say something a doctor once said because it's so visceral and it applies most of the time, but he said, you should breathe through your mouth as often as you eat through your nose. <laughs> Why? We pure, again, we're amazingly designed. We purify, warm, and humidify the air and oxygenate. I see somebody shake. She knows her anatomy. And oxygenate properly 
to all those little capillaries when we breathe through our nose. When we breathe through our mouths, we bypass a lot of that. And also, we won't get into the details, but your parasympathetic, your calming part of your nervous system, just rest and digest when you're breathing through your nose is activated. Have you ever seen, particularly an animal, have you ever seen somebody when they were like ill or, or really anxious hyperventilate through their nose? I mean, I've been doing yoga for 50 years, so there may be, <laughs> but <laughs> sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight. You're putting your body on high alert. So if you cannot breathe, through your nose for some reason, then you need to get that checked out. Do you have a deviated septum? Do you have congestion? Whatever it is, focus on your breathing. How? So I want to do this really simple technique. It's like, and I'm a certified breathing coach, uh, none of this complicated three, four, seven, two, six, eight, whatever. There's great stuff. I'm sure a lot of you have it on an app, and that's wonderful. Keep it up. But this you can do with your eyes open, your eyes closed. When you're in a meeting, when you're in the car in traffic and you're late, a million different uses for this. You want to be centered. You want to just elicit a relaxation response. So if you're willing, because I want you to focus on you for a sec, I want you to close your eyes and just breathe in and out just normally. In, out, in, out. This time, as you breathe in, I want you to be aware of that space between the breath in and the breath out. I don't want you to hold your breath particularly. I want you to just be aware that there is a space between the breath in and the breath out. That space is the absolute most present you can be. That is now. Now open your eyes. Because our minds are in the past and the future. Our body is never in the past and future. It's now. And when you go to that space, you are as present as you can be. And it's a wonderful way to center yourself. Now you want to go to more advanced stuff? That's great. But this is just breathing 101. It's as simple as it gets. But it's a tool you can practice because we all, you know, you as educators, practice it so that you become conscious when you're, when you're not, when you're here, there, everywhere, you can center yourself very easily that way. So who knows what keeps them from sleeping well? Who does, who's not sure? Okay, so let's see what it might be. So, yeah, that was sort of, but, but here's the difference. I, please, when you wake up, I get the question all the time. I wake up at about 3 in the morning every, every night. Well, you just told me a lot. You should not be looking at the clock because you activate your brain and all it wants to do is start thinking. So really, really important. And, you know, it takes a lot of willpower to start it, but just don't look at the clock. I was, I, my clock was so bright, as anybody who stayed here knows, so I actually put a towel over it. I tried a few other things, then I just went and got a towel. And <clears throat> but it, it sort of during the night when I woke up one of the times, I thought, don't, I don't want to know what time it is. I do not want to know what time it is. So all, these are all the different things. We can all relate. New baby, toddler, somebody sick, shift work. Nobody, is anybody here sh a shift worker? So that, that, but we all sort of operate like shift workers if you think about it, at least some of the time. Travel and jet lag, there's more you can learn about that. You know, this has been a hard time. And it's really had an impact on people's sleep. You know, look back at when school was closed and what it was like for you to just keep it, it was just, it was a huge infringement on our schedules and our time. So I'm going to pop all these up, a few of them. Let's start out with exercise. You shouldn't exercise within a couple hours or even three before bed. You're stimulating your body. You're raising your body temperature. It's just not the right time. Calming, restorative yoga before bed, okay. 
but going to the gym or going out for a long run just before bed is not a great idea. Caffeine and alcohol. Caffeine, if you have trouble falling or staying asleep, you should stop caffeine even by noon. It's 12 hours in your body. How, how you get rid of it. Some people say, oh, I can drink coffee, b espresso right before bed. It doesn't bother me. I don't know. If I had you hooked up to wires, I'd, be con I'd, I'd wonder. Alcohol may help you fall asleep, but it plays havoc with your sleep cycles and fragments your sleep. So that's, you know, it may help you fall asleep. It's not good. Okay, so somebody says to me, oh, I always have a liter of water. I'm always thirsty. Stay hydrated during the day. Because if you drink right before bed, guess what your bladder says in the middle of the night? Time out. I can't sustain this. I got to go to the bathroom. I mean, it's just same thing with food. You don't want to eat a lot of food before bed because you're horizontal and you've got new hormones and new enzymes working. They're finishing up digestion. But if you have a, a big meal an hour before bed and you go lay down, your body's saying, which would you prefer me to do? Do you want me to do the sleep thing or do you want me to do the digest thing? I can't do them both at the same time. Common sense. Don't pay bills before bed and no arguments. <laughs> Activity in bed. I once had a slide for Procter & Gamble and it said, save your bed for sleep and sex. But I couldn't put the word sex, so we put, and the other S in quotes. And so you just, you know, sleep, your, your bed is not your entertainment center or your auxiliary office. Your bed, you should associate with sleep. That's why you really don't want to nap in bed, unless you're sick. That's it. Don't look at the clock. Free yourself from time. It doesn't have to be a dream. It can be real. And all the great sleep habits in the world, if you have an undiagnosed, untreated sleep disorder, are a problem, and you need to <coughs> look into that. So we're going to go through these things pretty quickly. Where are we on time? 20? 12, okay. So you got to know where you are now to figure out where you want to go and what changes to make. And those two are in one of my courses called Sleep Well, Live Well. It's a four-week sleep improvement program because it's really important to become intimate with your sleep. What brought you here today? Well, you're at the conference. You were stuck with me if you didn't want to learn about sleep, but <laughs> hopefully you're learning something for someone else. Here's the things to do. You know, you have a notebook. Write it down. These are just... Conscious things to think about, to journal about, to keep track of. Yeah? Oh, good. I don't have to rush so much. Good. So, be honest. Be gentle to yourself. This is, you don't change sleep overnight, chronic sleep issues, or you don't know why you're not sleeping well any more than you chronic weight gain in a weekend. Your body has to adapt. If you go to bed at 1 in the morning and you say, I've got to start going to bed at 11, I really, so I'm going to start going to bed at 11. You can't just do it overnight. You can try, but your circadian clock is programmed and it needs ad adaptation. It needs a slower transition so you can adapt to these changes. But knowing, you know, start tonight. Like if you really want to improve your sleep, just write it down, Google a sleep diary. I'll, I'll give you a couple resources to get to, and I'll, you'll get an email <coughs> after this so that you can, um, you can find other resources to look into all this because nobody is going to change your sleep habits but you. And, and it's okay. It's, it's, it's really sort of exciting to know that you have the power to sleep well. That's it. Ah, your sleep sanctuary, your bedroom. Dark. What's so interesting, one of my colleagues who's one of the leaders in the world, she's actually, it's interesting that she's a, a highly renowned sleep physician and researcher. Her name is Z, Z-E-E. -E. Dr. Phil is Z. I know, it's crazy. <laughs> and I once, my kids had a teacher in first grade named Miss Schooley. Like, you can't make that up. 
And then she got married. We're, no, 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 you can't change your name. <laughs> but at any rate, Phyllis's work that has started coming out, new, new science shows that any light, even the light, well, you shouldn't have your cell phone next to your bed, but even a light on a, on a toothbrush, if you go to the bathroom, like a Sonicare toothbrush, a light from, look at your bedroom next time you're there and see how many little blue lights there are. And then go get some little pieces of duct tape and cover them. That light is enough to Im Im interrupt your sleep. Why? So does anybody know where th what their pineal gland is? P-I-N-E-A-L? It's the smallest organ in the body. And it's between, in the center of the brain. And when you look at light at night, oh, everybody close your eyes and go like, and then wave your hand up and down. You see the shadows? Light penetrates your eyes. So any light sends a signal to the pineal gland through your melanoptin receptor telling you it's, we're not going to sleep. Stop, stop releasing melatonin. By the way, that's another misconception. Melatonin doesn't come out just when you lay down to go to sleep. Again, human design, it starts hours before. As a matter of fact, just so I don't forget, seriously consider dimming the lights in your, in your home in the evening <coughs> as it starts to get dark out. In the summer, it's a little harder, but keep those bright lights. And even if you use night shift or flux on your computer or something on this, that, and the other thing, or where, well, there's still the brain stimulation. We'll talk about that. But just light at night. Now, blue light gets a bad rap, but it's blue light at the right time. So bedroom, uncluttered. Who... If your bedroom is cluttered and you see all this stuff laying there that you need to attend to, your mind is thinking, I need to do that. I should do this. I should do that. You, you want your bedroom to be peaceful. So it welcomes sleep. Mattresses and pillows, big, huge thing there. It's an investment in your sleep. And somebody, you know, no matter how much money they have, people are funny about spending money on a mattress. And somebody will have a $60,000 car, and you tell them to go get a $2,000 mattress, and they're like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, I tell, I tell real estate people, you should have people escrow money for a new mattress so that they can enjoy their new house. <laughs> and, and it's like, okay, so where do you spend more time, in your car or on your mattress? I'm not saying spend $10,000 on a mattress, but I'm saying get the best you can afford and make sure when you buy it, it's returnable. But a mattress is about comfort and body alignment. It's about knowing that your body is comfortable. You're there for a long time. And if, if you know, there can be difficulties when you have a, a bed partner for everybody to be happy with it. Another thing about pillows is the pillow you get is going to be dependent on your body position. Are you a back sleeper, a side sleeper? That's going to impact, because again, alignment. You don't want a, a side sleeper and have a pillow that you're like this. You want to keep that angle. If you're on your back, you don't want a big, thick pillow, so you're like this. So it's all about alignment and comfort. So, and oh, most important, what do you need to change? Over time, you know, okay, I can't get a new mattress now. I, it's not in my budget. Fine, but it's something you could get a new pillow topper or something. But don't let your bedroom go. And, and do you have blackout curtains? And there's, you know, if you have blackout curtains, it's marvelous for sleep. But are you opening them in the morning? Because that's when you want the light. And it, can you wear an eye mask? There's all kinds of solutions here. But you really go home and take a look at your bedroom and say, hey, what, what do I need to work on here? Is there anything I need to fix? So. Oh, I'm going to suggest a, uh, an ex oh, I didn't, can't believe I didn't use the word yet, experiment. You're, you're in education, you're used to experiments. Experiment with these changes, because they may not work for you. Experiment with what's going to help you sleep better and be better during your waking hours, and, s and try things. So about an hour before you're going to go to sleep, Set your phone alarm. This is just a, just a trial thing. 
and it may end up something you do. And then that's going to be you time. You time may be with your kids, it may be with your spouse, it may be with your partner, it may be with yourself, but that's designated time <coughs> to transition to sleep. And so set your phone alarm, and then who sleeps with their, well, we're gonna ask that question in a minute, but I know most of you sleep with your phone next to your bed. Last week with Deloitte, it was like 85% of the people had their phone next to their bed on. And you, who, who hears a ping, even if it's on silent, you look at the time and you see a text. Who, who, can, who has the willpower not to look at the time? Come on. So, so what you want to do is set your phone alarm for an hour before bed. And then if that's, your, if that's your alarm for the morning, I want you to put it aside where you can't reach it. It's willpower. You can do this. And then just, and if somebody has to call you for emergencies, put the ice in case of emergency or what other, what other app you have for that. And then if you're, if you're, don't go to bed hungry, but don't eat much. You have a sleep-friendly snack. What, we won't go into the details on that. And, and something, unless you have to pee a lot during the night, maybe you want a cup of chamomile tea. Calm conversation. Warm bath or shower. If you happen to be a morning shower person and you don't shower at night, I'm going to ask you to try it for a week. It's calming, wash the day away. It's a great time to practice mindfulness. Nothing's in there but you. I know there's a shower curtain that has a thing for your phone, but don't get that. <laughs> and, and just go, to, and who wants to get in bed dirty? Go to bed clean, respect your sleep, respect your bed. And so try this, if you're, not, if you're a morning shower person, try nighttime showers for a week and see what it feels like. And so you'll still shower in the morning. Stretching and yoga. I mean, you're going to be, now most of the people in the room have done yoga, so most everyone knows what child's pose is. If you're a little agitated going to bed, you just want to relax a little, go into child's pose before you get under the covers. It's extremely soothing. Peaceful music or sounds, a little dicey because if it's on your phone, you don't want to have your phone on just before bed. So be mindful of that. Reading or journaling. I just I had to answer qu a bunch of questions post-event from last week, and one of them was, can I read on my Kindle? Is that okay before bed? It depends if it's backlit, if there's blue light. All of those devices have s emit some blue light. The best thing is a paper book and a, a you know an incandescent dim dim bulb. That's the best thing you could do. And journaling, take the worries out of your head and put them on paper. And by the way, I'll say it twice. Yeah, there's your journal. Do your best to process worries and anxiety during the day. I cannot tell you through the pandemic that was one of the top reasons that people couldn't sleep well because they were bringing everything to bed with them. Not that we didn't historically. Mindfulness, meditation practices. And there, that's it. Free yourself from time. And then it just occurred to me last week, wait a minute, we have a clock inside of us. So you're never freed from time, but you can free yourself from the external reminder of time and let your internal clock do its work. And I like, that. that's really cool. We, can, we have an internal clock. So, truth be told, who sleeps with their phone on and next to them in their bed? Who does not? Yay. Somebody, tell me why you don't have it in your bedroom. I'm sorry to just call on you out of the blue, but. I'm really busy, so I got to take it. Wow. And how's your sleep? I did not plan this. <laughs> Bedtime culprits, TV, iPad, cell phone, you know. Blue light at the wrong time. Why? Because the blue light, as I said, goes through the, you know, tells the pineal gland, stop releasing melatonin. We're not, we're, we're staying alert. It's just the way we're designed. Brain switch is the other issue. Asi okay, so you say I have blue light blocking glasses and I did this and I have that program. You're stimulating the brain. 
how hard. Think about what you've processed in the last hour. We're so, our brains can't take it all in. And when they do take it all in, they need to process it and encode memory and the glymphatic system and all this stuff while we're sleeping. So you've got to let it work. Who, wears, um, who tracks their sleep? That's great if the information it gives you doesn't give you more anxiety. Because there's an actual sleep disorder called orthosomnia. And that is sleep disorder for people who have anxiety about sleep because they're trying to sleep correctly based on the information from their tracker. <laughs> Solutions. There it is. Just experiment. Take your devices. Cover the blue lights with some duct tape or, you know, or painter's tape or whatever works. And try an alarm clock. I have an old-fashioned little dee -dee 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 clock. And I, I always, I wake up, I set it, but I wake up generally, and the same time every day, seven days a week, and generally I wake up before it, but it's good to have. So we're going to do a little experiment here. And we're going to take these three things. Remember I said earlier that your body is always in the present. It's your mind in the past and the future. So body awareness is a really cool thing to use to help you go to sleep. Gratitude. When you're, Maya Angelou said, let gratitude be the pillow upon which you kneel to say your nightly prayers. And if you're not saying prayers, you can still be grateful for something. And if it's been a really crappy day, or you don't feel well, or you're upset, just reprogram your brain. Go to something you're grateful for. It's going to switch where your brain's functioning, and it's going to help you relax. And then breathing. So I'm going to ask you to just think about doing this. We don't have, we're not going to take a lot of time. And I, I'm doing some of the uh, break, the um, round tables. And so come and we can spend a little more time on this. But if you were to start at your feet, get out of your head, and you can close your eyes now if you want to, and breathe into your feet. Because you are breathing into your feet. You're breathing into your whole body. And hopefully your mouth is closed and your nasal breathing. And you breathe into your feet, and you just are aware of them, and you say, feet, thank you so much for all you did for me today. You don't have to do anything right now. You ran three miles. You ran around the halls of the school. Whatever. You just rest, and thank you so much. And that's body awareness, breathing, and gratitude. And then go through your body, body parts. You have a sore knee, sore hip, whatever you have. Spend some time there. Then... You can open your eyes now. Who's ever thanked their heart for beating? Thank, start thanking your heart when you go to bed at night because it's not stopping. And it deserves some gratitude. And then go up to your eyes. Oh, my gosh, your eye, whatever body part you want to go to. I start at the feet to get out of the head. And just combine the three. It's very powerful, and it's beautiful. It's a, it's a beautiful thing to thank parts of your body for all they do for you. Positive thoughts. Program your subconscious before you go to sleep. It's a really great thing to do because even if you're really upset about something, why don't you just give, because you have that power, think about it as if it were going well or how you'd like to see it or something you're looking forward to because that will, we know if we go to bed all agitated and yeah, that we're not going to sleep so well. Tell, I just read this in an article last week. I love this. Whoever wakes up during the night thinking about positive thoughts and how happy they are. <laughs> I just said, thank you. That's like so puts it so well. So if you're tossing and turning and can't fall asleep, then don't stress in bed. Just get up. Don't look at the clock, but get up, walk around, go empty the dishwasher, fold some laundry, just do something relaxing, and in really not falling asleep, then get a book that's not a good novel that you can't put down and read for a little bit. If you awaken during the night, do not look at the clock and try the combination practice. This is part of life. It's, remember I said a good night's sleep begins when you wake up. And one of the things I'm going to send, you'll get a copy, you'll get a link to it. I did a bed-making video for LinkedIn, The Art of Making Your Bed. It's a 10-minute video about how to make your bed. And look, 
Navy SEALs, one of their principles is make your bed. It's a task completed, and it's a beautiful thing, no matter what your day was like, to return to a nice bed. So making your bed is really important. It separates day from night. So I'll send you my video about that that I had done for LinkedIn. And then, you know, just all these things are great practices. So let's, let's, let's end with these. And just this is a way to start your day. And again, throughout the day, process those worries, whether it's meditation, therapy, a mindfulness practice, exercise, talking to a friend, journaling, anything, so you're not carrying it all to bed with you. And again, this has been a huge culprit, news at night. I mean, if you're doing that and you're on your phone in bed watching, just, again, try it for a week, no news at night, and see what happens. You'll be surprised. There was that show, uh, Good News, but unfortunately, um, John Kaczynski, I think, sold it to one of the stations, and we haven't seen it since. We could use that program again. It was a lot of fun. And then just all these things. Be consistent with your sleep and wake time. Try it. Probably most important is just to recognize to yourself that you're working on it and give yourself kudos that you're trying. And again, regular gratitude. That is just, if any, if nothing else, Gratitude can be a big shape shifter for our sleep and our waking hours. And that's, you know, that's life 24 7. That's, that's actually, I love this picture. It came to me from Susan, some, one of the teachers sent it. And it's all these kids with their journals or their paper. You know, you got to be awake to be engaged and invested in that. So that's that. And I'm going to, you'll get an email with the, with the two courses. My course on LinkedIn Learning, Sleep is Your Superpower, it's a half an hour. The other one's four weeks. They're, they will be easily accessible. And again, this one-hour crash sleep course isn't going to do it all for you. You're going to have to just look at a, a pathway. So we'll get that to you. And we probably have, uh, do we have a couple minutes for questions? Because we can get them in the sessions too. Okay, questions. Do I have an opinion on grounding sheets? This is the first time I've heard that term. Is this like weighted blankets? No, it's, it's a sheet that you can put on the outside oh. and it grounds you through like the whole. So it has magnets in it and all? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. So I don't know anything about these, but there's a lot of stuff out there. It's a mega billion dollar industry, and I, you can't imagine the stuff that comes to my way to try. I'm going to tell you to ground yourself on your own sheets <laughs> by, by practicing good, a good sleep routine and trying some of the things I've suggested. And so when you lay down, you are grounded on your mattress to get a good night's sleep with good intention, good thoughts, relaxation. But if it works for you, but I want you in the first couple of weeks to keep a journal and say, is this helping me? Back there with the, uh, you've got a white sweater, I think. Yeah. Okay, please come to my round table and I am going to teach you a breathing cooling technique for hot flashes and you're never going to be the same. You're going to say, and then anybody else wants to learn it, like you're, you're somewhere, there's no air conditioning, you're hot. It comes from a, a, a Indian yoga tea. It's incredible. Yeah. Ah, so... So cannabinoids for sleep. Again, I have an MBA, not an MD after my name. I'm, uh, you should look it up. I want you to check contraindications with other things you do and see if it works for you. I can't recommend that, but I would say it ends up being a crutch for a lot of people, as is melatonin, because they have really cr crappy or not so good sleep habits. 
And so they go to all these things, and their doctors give them Ambien and all this stuff, when what they really needed to do was start with a baseline and see what can I do to change my sleep. And that's really self-empowerment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Th thank you very much, Nancy. We appreciate that, and uh, I hope that.